Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinets Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinets. Our guest today is Josh Little. Josh, are you ready, ready to be great today? Absolutely. Josh Little is the founder of four tech companies, Maestro, Bloomfire, um, QZZR, and Volley. They have collectively been used by hundreds of millions of people. His work has been featured in TechCrunch, Massable, Entrepreneur, Inc., and Forbes. With two successful exits and a third pending, he's currently on a mission to save the working world from death by meetings with his fourth creation volley. Josh, thanks you for your time today. I knew you had a lot going on, so I'm really appreciative of you taking the time to talk to us today. You bet. It's my pleasure. And uh, the, the name of that company, QZZR, is called Quizzer. Why Quizzer. would somebody name a company without vowels? What a dumb <laughs> idea. Who, who thought of that? So on your, I believe it's on your LinkedIn profile, you state you're a serial entrepreneur. A lot of people say, I'm a serial entrepreneur. But really, what does that mean? What does it mean to be a serial entrepreneur? What's your definition of that? Well, uh, that you've started multiple companies um, and, you know, then then there's all varying degrees of the success of the serial entrepreneur. Because I suppose if you have a, a an ice cream stand and a lemonade stand, you, you're technically a serial entrepreneur. But, um, you know, it, it kind of depends on the scale or the scope of those companies and the degree of their success. So, so I'm a serial entrepreneur and many people claim that, but um, I'm really proud of the the companies I've built and the um, the products I've created and that now are part of the tech fabric of the world. So is there a difference between being an entrepreneur with a, you know, trying to be an entrepreneur with a tech startup versus being an entrepreneur is like a, I won't call it like a lifestyle, it's a lifestyle business. It's still entrepreneurship, right? Although still entrepreneurship. Yep. Same playbook, just different plays. Um, you, you know, the tech companies require, different sort of thinking, different sort of effort, um, different sort of capital commitment and team. Um, it's really hard to build a software company that is a lifestyle business if it's going to be a, a, a large, valuable, enduring company. And that's what you hope to build as a software company. Uh, but uh, it, it is possible to build tech that is kind of smaller or niche focused that could be a lifestyle company for sure. Those are just not the opportunities that are most exciting to me. I like I like doing big things way earlier than anyone should. <laughs> so Josh, you're in your fourth company. Like why, why so many companies? Like, are you going for punishment? The entrepreneurship is not easier, right? You just keep on going back over and over again. You just like the lifestyle, the excitement. What is it that entices you about, about this lifestyle? Well, it, it's the zero to one. That's what I love. Um, it's the first year. If I, I've said many times, if I could just... If I could have a job where someone would pay me to just build the company for the first year and then just, I could just step away, no obligations, no questions asked, and somebody could just take it from there and successfully run it. I would do that job because I love the first year. And after it's like, I, I relate it to building Lego. Um, I like building the thing, uh, but once it's built and it kind of works, I don't want to play with it. It's, you know, I want to break it and I want to build another thing. So uh, I don't mind, like I'm, I'm an okay manager, I'm sure. There's thousands of managers probably here in the state of Utah that are better than me. Um, but there, I, there are very few that can take something zero to one as quickly and as successfully, in my opinion. So I, that's the phase I like. So may call it glutton for punishment or just, you know, loving the early days. And, and frankly, after, after a company gets to a certain stage or scale, it, I'm, I'm doing the company a disservice if I think that I'm going to be the best leader for this organization over time. And so um, all of my companies after I've left have, have taken a, a bit of a dip, but then they all like come back and, and thrive long-term with, with different leaders. And I, I just don't think I could have, or would have been interested in shifting those gears. So a little bit why, you know, get something going and then move on to the next thing. So Josh, you, you, you bring up a good point. Like, I think you displayed that great humility, right? I think a lot of entrepreneurs nowadays are like have egos, super egos. The company's going to fail without me. I have to be the CEO on and on. But you're humble enough to know that, hey, maybe this is the best spot, best thing for my company. I need to step back. Where does this, this humility come from? 
Oh, I don't know. Maybe growing up in rural Michigan and not not having a lot or not seeing other examples around. I I, I don't know. Um, it's it's earned or growing up as a fat kid and still being a fat man, <laughs> probably part of it as well. So from your point of view, and I think I know the answer, is it should, a, should an entrepreneur focus on bringing in paying customers or bringing in users? Sorry, can you ask the question again? Should, should an entrepreneur focus on bringing in paying users, paying customers, I mean, or bringing in users? Well, it all depends on the type of company and what you're trying to build. Um, if, if you're building a product with a freemium model, you have to start with users. Um, it, it, otherwise, uh, you know, if, if you're charging up front for your product, you have to bring in customers and, and that's going to be the most important thing. With Volley, we're mo most interested in bringing in users. And in the beginning, when you're building a, a, a software for a and kind of a new way to do an old thing. So Volley is a new way to meet with your team and other professionals. You kind of have to figure it out. And yet, you, you, you know, you have a seed of an idea. Well, you know, I think asynchronous video would be a really powerful way to have, have conversations or meetings and you could take them over time and you could listen to others on 2X and you could take time to think about your response before you you um, you give them. So you start with the seed of an idea or an angle of maybe a better way to do something that currently exists. But then it's really hard to nail it first try. And, you know, I'm working with a very talented team. We've all built successful companies, but we're not convinced that we've nailed it yet. We love our product and it's working for hundreds of teams. But, um, you know, we think there's a little bit more that we can, we can add to the product and uh, refine the experience to get them there. So if you're building a product in a, in a new category or in a, in a new place to an ex a new solution to an existing category, you kind of have to start with users because you're really working on product market fit at that point. Um, but if you're, if you're building, let's say, uh, an LMS or a CRM, um, it's an existing category and you're kind of building something that's innovative, not different. Maybe you have a new feature or something. Then you have to start with customers. Long way to answer your question. <laughs> yes. So, so Josh, from your point of view, what makes a good entrepreneur? So I think willingness to learn is one of the top qualities. I, I don't think I would have been able to have the success that I've had if I, if I weren't um, a voracious learner. Um, and I wasn't a great student. Uh, so I don't think academics or performance in school has anything to do with willingness to learn or ability to learn. Uh, but I do when, when I have to learn something um, or present with a challenge, I, I have been able to be pretty good at reading that book or that blog or getting that expert um, on the phone or wh whatever it takes to get over this hurdle. It's, it's something I think I've been able to be good at and something I've identified in other successful entrepreneurs is, is that they, they care almost nothing about being right. Um, you know, that their instinct was right, that they were this mad genius. They, they care everything about making something work. And in order to do that, you have to be able to learn. So Josh, here's a question for you. I like, suppose an entrepreneur out there, right? They're doing the right thing for the reason that they, they, they can't figure it out, right? They, they started two, three, four, five companies. Each company doesn't make it. They're learning, they're learning. They keep on going back to the well, different ideas. You know, for some reason, nothing works out. Either the team is not right. If something isn't right, right. It doesn't work out right. Would you recommend this person like stop for a while and go back to corporate and do something different or just keep on, you know, grind it, so to speak, until he, until he makes it? Well, it depends on the specifics of that question. Depends on why it's not working. Um, it, you know, I, I wouldn't say the answer would be quit and go do something else. Um, there's always a, a hundred ways to make things work. Sometimes you just need the right person to help you. So for example, this is not a business, but I just had an internet issue today uh, with my switch and my mesh system and I, I couldn't figure it out. And I, I just called a friend who's technical and I just needed to talk through it with him to recognize, oh, there is one thing I haven't tried that I could and I did. So I, I think that's what my answer would be is 
your answer is not usually found from going into a cave or solitude or spending more time around your whiteboard or working harder thinking. It's usually found in getting around a table with someone else or um, connecting to someone else that, that has been through the, the narrow passage that you're trying to navigate and can help you through it. So Josh, you know, you have a great team. And like, I don't think people realize how hard it is not only to be a startup founder, like to, to quote unquote recruit people to work for your startup team. Can you talk about your process of making sure you have the right people on your team? Yeah, so that's refined. Each time I've built a company, I realize, you know, mistakes I made early on and I try not to make those mistakes again. And then I make new mistakes and then I try not to make those again. Um, so, uh, you know, a common question is how do you find engineers? Because I'm, I am a, a non-technical founder. I am technical, I just don't code. Um, so how do you find engineers? And my answer to that is always, well, how many engineers are you friends with? And typically they'll say none. And I say, well, that's, a, that's where you start, is you start being friends with, with engineers, not because you want to someday start a business with them, but because you want to be friends with them and learn what they do and what makes them work. And, um, and so, yeah, I have hundreds of friends who are engineers now. And so when, when it comes to building a software company, I have kind of the pick of the litter, especially given the success I've had because engineers tend to be risk averse and don't want to jump on some crazy idea with some crazy person who's never done anything. So, but you, you have to overcome that first hurdle. So finding people in early days is always kind of in your circle of trust. Another thing people ask is how, how do I find my first 10 customers? And my answer almost is almost always, you already know them. Um, whether it's you're selling HR software, you probably know 10 HR managers. If not, it's probably like one connection away on LinkedIn. So you, you just start with like expanding those circles of trust that you have worked really hard to establish. And those are usually the right people. And typically the wrong people for the early days in a startup I've found are the people that have been really successful in large companies. So if they've been a really successful engineer at a large company, or they've been really successful at sales, like they crushed their quota at Pfizer or something, I would not bring them into your startup because they're going to starve and die because they're used to things being figured out. They're used to tools existing. They're used to teams, you know, and assistants figuring things out for them and just going after, you know, a, a tried and true process. And you're just trying to learn in, in the beginning when you start a company. So I've found greater success um, hiring salespeople who have never sold before and don't know what good looks like or bad looks like and are just trying to figure it out as much as you. And I don't, for that reason, I don't call them salespeople. I usually call them ambassadors in the beginning. I like, I like that ambassadors. That sounds mm -hmm. a lot better. So let's say there's an entrepreneur out there. He has an idea for a tech company, but he's like, you know, not, well, he's tech, not tech, does not a code. Would this be, be, would this person be better serve learn how to code and build a product himself? Or like you said, you know, trying to make friends with engineers and have the- Yeah, make friends. I used to say, I used to think, you know, after I sold my second company, I thought, I, I took some time off and I thought, I'm going to learn how to code. Because if I could code, I would be a one-man band and wouldn't that be great, right? And uh, so I did. And I hired a tutor and started working in learning to code. I spent a couple months doing it. And I could, I could see the top of the mountain. I could see the peak after a while. I, I knew I could get there. It's going to take a couple of years but I knew I could learn to code and be successful. Like I said, I'm a, I'm a pretty technical person. Um, but what I also realized is that the peak moves every day. And you have, if, if you wanna, if you wanna be an excellent programmer or engineer, you have to sort of devote your life to this and staying on top of technology and how it's moving and where, where things are shifting and new tools and techniques. If, you, if you're not interested in doing that, you shouldn't even start up the mountain. And that's what I realized a couple months in is, oh, you know what? I don't want to devote my life, life to this, but I know people that do. And I would be much better off getting better at the things I'm already like naturally programmed to do. Um, and then just finding people who want to work with me, who want to devote their lives to being technical. So I, I never recommend, oh yeah, learn to code. Um, if you, if you want to build a tech company, much better to just go find the people that have already committed to do that. 
what's what's been your, your key or your process as, as bringing in good engineers I, I know they're friends and stuff but like that question is like you know all engineers aren't the same right some are great some not so great you know from your background how do you determine this this engineer is really doing his job this one's not right and, and separate them when they need to be separated or rewarded well, them when they need to be rewarded yeah i'll be honest it's really hard for me to tell um you you, you sort of you can kind of build off of the trust of where they've worked you know for example if if they worked at you know somewhere like google or facebook um they can't be a slouch because you, you know if, if you're terrible you usually can't get into google or facebook or you know some legitimate company like that so you you kind of need to go from the track record um but what i try to do is i you know i i founded volley with uh, two technical co-founders two engineers and so i really rely on my co-founders to kind of vet um, any, any, anyone's technical chops or, or their ability. But I will say, um, even if somebody has the ability, it might be at the wrong stage. That's kind of what I meant. Um, you know, hiring an engineer who's worked and been successful at, um, at a, a large established company that's, you know, hundreds of millions of revenue, let's say, um, is also probably going to have a hard time shifting gears down to, the, the way you need to work in a startup, because the, the way that you work at a, an established company is very different. You care about scalability, you care about extensibility, you, you care about um, automation and, and tests and, and these things that, that you need when you're at scale and you've got millions of users and you've, you, you've solved the problem, you just now need to build it out of iron. Um, but in the beginning in a startup, you, you need to build with wood and it needs to be, you need to be able to rip a wall down and put a new one up tomorrow if we learn that that's where the wall needs to be um, because, because it is pliable and we're learning every day. So not every engineer is able to do that or has had a chance to do that in their career. Um, so they, they have to really be committed to that. So what you'll find is engineers who they've kind of spent their whole career in startups because they, they like working in wood and they don't care about building a battleship out of iron and, um, and, and they don't want to learn how to do that because it doesn't sound like fun. Um, and you find other engineers who have only built battleships and they've never, you know, hammered a nail in their life, even though they built software. I don't know if that analogy is, is holding up, but you know, that, that is what's true. And, and it's not just black or white, like you're either a startup person or not. There's a, a whole gradient in between, but it, it is um, something to consider. And Josh, you're in the Utah area, right? Salt Lake City, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and there, it's called Silicon Slopes, I believe, right? Yep. So talk about the tech scene there in Utah. I mean, I, I'm hoping people know it's a pretty vibrant scene there, but what's your take on the tech scene there? Has it given the resources that you want? Is the VC funding what you want? Or is like, what's your take on that? Yeah, absolutely. It's the reason I live here, actually. I grew up and started my first two companies in Michigan. And while Michigan's a great place to start a tier one auto supplier or a chemical company, it's not great for SaaS um, and software. You can find engineers, but uh, that's about it. It's, it's hard to find designers. It's hard to find somebody who can market or sell software. Um, so I ended up hiring a designer out here in Utah uh, through a mutual connection. And his first week on the job, I decided I was going to go out and work with him. And just to get to know him and get him plugged in, um, onboarding and whatnot. And I thought, well, you know, while I'm there, maybe I'll just uh, send out a few LinkedIn requests and post on a, you know, Ruby on Rails users group and just say, hey, I'm, I'm here, you know, love to just, I hear the Utah tech scene is, is booming. I'd love to see you. And I had like 25 people come out of the woodwork that said they wanted to meet with me that week and that they wanted to, uh, you know, just see what I was doing with Bloomfire, which was the product I was building at the time. And it was so bizarre because if you, if you cleared my calendar and gave me six months in Michigan to find 25 people who could sell and market and build SaaS products, I don't think I could do it. But in Utah, it just happened. So I came home from that week and realized, you know what? I think we need to move to Utah. And I told my wife and we had built our dream house on the lake there in Michigan. We had two companies didn't expect to ever be moving. Um, but, you know, a couple months later, we sold the house. We're out here in Utah and, and haven't looked back. It's, it's been amazing. And yeah, so the Utah tech scene 
has been burgeoning companies like Qualtrics just sold last year for 8 billion. Pluralsight um, just sold for like 3.5 billion. So, um, you know, the, it comes from legacy Novell and WordPerfect were here that kind of built um, the, the tech scene. Um, and then it's just kind of blossomed. And now, you know, in Utah, there are several unicorns, companies like Podium or Divi are well on their way to unicorn status, if not there. Are you seeing like a lot of people moving there from the, from the Bay Area because of, you know, uh, better cost of living, better resources, that kind of stuff? We are, yes. And it's driving up our house prices, which uh, <laughs> is great if we're going to sell and move away, but I don't want to. Yes. Um, Josh, is there such a thing as a good meeting? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, it, it, meetings are just kind of universally hated. And that's why, you know, our mantra at Bloomfire, or <laughs> Bloomfire, at Volley, wow, how did I slip there? Uh, is uh, saving the world from death by meetings. Um, and everyone can identify with that. Everyone has been in, you know, some environment where it's just like the only way to get things done is to meet. And it seems like we have back to back meetings all day. So there is such a thing as a good meeting, but most aren't. And that those are the those are what we're solving for with Volley. Volley is a video messaging app that allows you to replace back-to-back -back meetings with threaded video conversations, asynchronous video conversations. And so what, what does that look like? Well, imagine video texting. Um, you know, what would that even look like if you could text with video? I know that's not a thing, but that explanation seems to get people there or um, Snapchat or Marco Polo for work. That's the idea because what are you trying to do when you when you have a meeting? Well, you're really just trying to talk. Um, you're trying to have a conversation. And there's really only two ways you, you can communicate with your coworker. You can type at them through Slack or email or chat, or you can talk. And when you when you cross that threshold, when written communication fails to do its job, you you really only have two options now. You can either jump on a call or set up a meeting, but both of those are kind of called meetings, right? Um, you, you, even though we're on a call, I would refer to this as a meeting. I have a meeting at, you know, two 30 or, or whatever. So if you're really just trying to have a conversation and conversations are turn-based, meaning you take a turn, I take a turn, we've taken, you know, five or six turns in this conversation today. Why do I have to take my turn when you're talking and you take your turn when I'm talking? Well, it's only because we live in this synchronous world. It's only because of time and space. But what if we could use technology to allow us to have those conversations outside of time or space? What if I could ask you a question um, because I'm blocked on something and, and you don't have to listen to me while I'm talking, but you can, you can listen in 10 minutes when you have a break or time to think um, and get back to me in 10 minutes and, and unblock me then. Well, that's pretty awesome. Now we don't have to have a meeting. That's one less meeting I had because otherwise we needed to get together in a room around a whiteboard to solve this problem. And, you know, meetings have a whole host of inefficiencies as well, not just the interruptive nature. Um, you know, we've, we've all had the back-to-back -back schedule with, you know, a half an hour there and 20 minutes there. Um, but, you know, there's inefficiencies such as like technical difficulties, waiting for the other people to arrive, the meandering of the conversation, people that don't need to be there, the person that talks too much, the person, the people that don't talk enough, and, and how do we get everyone included in, in this meeting? And so meetings just have a lot of bad behavior around them that can be solved with technology. And, and that's um, why we're, you know, with, with Volley, we, we're aiming to save the world from death by meetings because we, we do think it is a slow death. I know one thing, so I'm an introvert, and I used to always not like meetings because it seemed like always, the extroverts always like dominate the meetings, right? You got one yep. extrovert like dominating 90% of the conversation, and introverts have something to say, but then in, but you know what, they've talked all the time, and the meeting is over with. So yeah, I've always been against meetings for that part. I'm the same, I'm the same person. This is why I wasn't a great student, is I, I just didn't know what to say in class or why to say it. And I've had several engineer users of Volley say something like one engineer in particular said, you know what, my friends on Snapchat and WeChat um, think I'm funny. They think I'm confident, but no one at work thinks that about me because 
in a meeting, I just don't know what to say. I feel awkward. I trip over my words. And so we're, we're hearing that from intro, like in, in, introverted users or identify as introverts. And then we're also hearing from managers, you know what, there's a couple of my, people on my team that are showing up totally different in Bali than anything else. And I think that's because us introverts need some time to prepare a response. We feel better and more confident if we've been able to gather our thoughts a little bit and, and we want to be thoughtful. We want, we do have something to say. We don't, and, and we, we encode, we don't encode while we're talking, we encode while we're quiet, unlike extroverts, which encode, uh, they, they have to talk to think, right? Extra introverts are the other way. We have to stop talking to think, uh, which, or at least I'm very much that way. Yeah. So one cool thing about volley is it sort of evens that playing field. It sort of allows the introvert and the extrovert to have an equal opportunity to hit the record button and to chime into that conversation because we don't have this, this time box and, and the extroverts can't just rule the, the 30 minutes that we scheduled. I mean, how many times have, you know, for me personally been in a meeting as an introvert and then something comes up and then by the time I have my thoughts and what I want to say, they're like four subjects over, right? And so I, yep. I can't say this, I'll look stupid, right? <laughs> like, so you just keep quiet. That's right. Yeah. And you know, there's uh, one bit of research I found that was pretty interesting is universally across all languages and across all cultures, there's a 200 millisecond gap between turns in a conversation. That's less than a second. If, if you wait 600 milliseconds to give your response after someone ends their turn, it's considered an awkwardly long pause. So that's not enough time to formulate a response. So in order to formulate a response, I have to think while you're talking and you have to think while I'm talking, like right now you have to be thinking about your next question because you know, you have 200 milliseconds to come back with a, a thoughtful question. But the problem is you don't know when I'm going to stop talking. I could stop talking right now. And then you're like, oh man, I haven't thought enough about what to ask next. Right. But this is a thing. This is a problem with synchronous conversation, especially for introverts who I want I want just a little bit of time to think. And this is the time to think problem that Mary Bud Rowe did all this research back in the 70s and 80s. She found that if you tell a student that they're going to have three seconds to think about a, a problem before they give their answer, and they can't give an answer until three seconds has gone by, they come up with better, more thoughtful, more succinct responses. And so that's kind of the beauty of this asynchronous video conversations that we enable with Volley is sometimes that's all you need is like five seconds to just think. And because I didn't have to think about my response while you were talking, I was all in on listening to you. And then I can stop and think for five or 10 seconds or 10 minutes, whatever it, it, it needs. And then I can get back to you with a more thoughtful response. And when you get back to me, I can listen to you on 2X. So what we think we're inventing here is better conversation or conversation 2.0 or elevated because it has all of these superpowers and, and, you know, it steps aside all these, the problems with synchronous communication that we've been talking about. Josh, so how do you prevent, prevent someone from waiting too long to reply? Like, you know, two, three days later, they have replied or provide an answer. How do you stop that? Or Well, that, that can from? happen. Uh, our software, you know, does have things like automated emails that come out 24 hours after. If you haven't watched someone else's volley in 24 hours, we'll just say, hey, you got a volley from so-and-so. Maybe they didn't see the notification or are kind of ignoring the badge. Um, so we try our best, but we can't really stop bad behavior. Just like texting, um, you know, 90% of text messages are read in six seconds after they're sent. Um, so there tends to be pretty responsive behavior and we see similar behavior with volley. It's kind of like video texting. That's why I think it's a good analogy. Um, it's the, it's the richness of talking, but the flexibility of texting, but you, and we all have forgotten to respond to a text message. And so people can forget to respond to volleys. We do our best to remind them, but you know, then that person can either send another volley or text message or react to one of their volleys and they'll get a new notification. So we've tried to solve for a, a number of ways, but maybe not completely solved. Josh, does the name volley have any specific meaning or special meaning? Well, volley, if you think of volleyball, it's hitting a ball over a net back and forth or the, the term volley or the definition of volley is to send 
you know, it's an artillery definition, but to send ammunition over one direction, it's like one launch of, of, of one, you know, am, uh, of, of your ammunition or your, your weapon. So um, I don't like the weaponized angle of that, but, uh, but yeah, it's, it's just sending something over that you expect to be bounced back. We volley back and forth or in tennis, let's volley for serve. So what, what does that mean? Well, you're going to hit the ball back and forth until we come to a conclusion who's going to serve. And volley is very much like that. Um, it, a, a half an hour meeting takes, you know, five to seven minutes in volley because you can listen to everyone on 2x and there's none of the cruft and there's really only like five volleys that really need to happen even though in the meeting we probably would would do 30 volleys and then we'd fill out the time and then we'd talk about someone's cat and then deal with technical difficulties so um yeah that's that's the origin of the name well oh, oh, having been in the army for 25 years i definitely understand the philatelic reference oh yeah that's right so next question, I'm, I'm taking generalities, generalities here, but most people can't, can, don't communicate well, especially leaders. Why, why is this you think? Why do most of us have trouble communicating? Well, um, there's a number of factors. One thing that I heard recently I thought was good, Patrick Lencioni said, um, leaders lead in meetings. And um, it's true kind of. And I think what he's trying to say is leaders lead in interaction with their team, um, which unfortunately happens mostly in meetings. Um, it can happen on chat, but written text is only 7% of the communication picture and pipeline that tone of voice and speed and body language can give. So, you know, with video, we get the other 93%. Um, so, uh, if if leaders lead in interactions with their team, how can you how can you improve uh, how, how can you improve their leadership? Well, um, either improve those interactions or improve, increase the number of interactions that are even possible. And with volley, we we try to help with both. In fact, we've coined this idea of um, continuous leadership. Um, so it, with volley, we, teams that are using volley heavily are volleying back and forth all day. Um, I had an idea, I ran into a problem. Hey, what do you think about this? Um, I, I just want to make an announcement, you know, for all of the reasons you would expect to meet, right? But because they're so small and bite-sized and you can fit them and tuck them into corners of your day, you get all of this time for deep work. Um, and, and because we're interacting so much constantly, we, uh, we, we kind of don't need to touch base. We kind of don't need to have a one-on-one -on -one because all day, all week, we've been interacting about the things that matter and we have complete clarity over what, what's working. So that's what we're doing at Bali to try to improve communication or leadership is, is to enable continuous leadership or on-demand leadership. So why is a one-on-one -on -one scheduled a, a thing that you do once a week or once a month, whatever the cadence is? Well, because the time and place world requires it. That's the only way we can get our faces in a room or on a, a you know, a video conference together to say the things in front of each other that we need to say. But that technically doesn't need to happen if there was enough communication and iteration. I know it's a wild idea, like even stand-ups, I haven't even told my team this yet, but I've stopped listening to stand-ups for the last couple of weeks just to kind of experiment to see if I wasn't in the loop because that's what stand-up should do. It's a meeting you have every morning to kind of sync up and let everyone know what you were working on yesterday, what, what you're going to work on today. But because of volley, I already know that. I already know what they're going to be working on today. So it's a little experiment. And I know I've spilled this to a few of our, uh, our users and teams that are using volley and they think it's a little radical, but they're starting to see the light like, oh yeah, maybe we don't need stand up if we're, if we're constantly in the flow of work and we're constantly connected, um, which would be a beautiful thing, right? Yes, yes it is. So Josh, is there something somewhere that says, you know, X amount of time is a perfect amount of time to do a meeting? No, not at all. And, and I hate that meetings are even time box. Like SAP just did this, uh, um, mandate and said all meetings are either 25 or 50 minutes. And 
if you really think about, and the reason they, they did that is they didn't want back-to-back -back meetings. So if you had two 25 minute meetings in an hour, you still had five minutes to like use the restroom or do whatever you need to do. But what are we saying with that? What is, what is that idea? Are we saying that we can just magically do something in 25 minutes that we would have done in 30? And if so, why? And if, and why couldn't we do it in 15 minutes or, or five minutes even, right? And I think there's something to that, that meetings, you know, as I said before, are kind of like sponges. They fill up whatever time block you give them. And that's the unfortunate reality. But the problem is if you don't time block them, they'll fill up even more than that. And you'll sit there and kind of chew at ideas and you won't feel the pressure of the shot clocks. So the, that's not a better solution at all. So no, I don't think there is a, a good established time for a meeting other than um, let's get to the meat of the problem and dive in and make sure that everyone understands it and we're aligned on it and we can all weigh in with our thoughts and um, you know, our strategy moving forward so that we can come to a decision. And that's, you know, that's the essence of most meetings, hopefully. Um, and if, if you can just peel away all of that cruft and all of that sponge um, and just get to the, the heart of it, um, you, can, you can have meetings that really only take five minutes because that's really all, all that you need. And I think everyone can identify that. Like we've all been in way too many meetings that were like, you know what, that could have been an email. You know, that's a popular thing. This meeting could have been an email. Why? Well, because there was only like five minutes of real content. The rest was just filler and conjecture. So with Volley, we, we kind of have that naturally, which is something I'm excited about is you don't, you're not uh, incentivized at all to meander in Volley. You, 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 you push record, you get to the point, you, you give your thought, you ask your question and you move on with your day. So you say what you say and you move on with your day. Um, and, and because of that, it helps increase efficiency because of removing all of that sponge. And I feel like there was a, a lot of sponge in my response there as well. So uh, I'm not I'm not excluding myself from uh, extra sponge in, in response. So, you know, the US Army does a lot of things well. One thing the Army does not do well is meetings, right? In the Army, we would do meetings to prep for meetings, right? And like, there's a meeting, nothing related to you, you have to be there, right? There's so much wasted time in the military on, on meetings, like, well, you have to brief someone next week while well, you have to do a full rehearsal in front of someone else. It's just so much wasted time in the military and the meetings. That was very frustrating, right? Mm -hmm. um, has COVID been a positive or negative for your business? How has COVID affected you and your company? Well, positively, um, it's the reason the company was created. We just started last May. We just started building this um, because, because we saw teams having to be forced remote and not having the tools they need to succeed, to, to have that fun and spontaneity that we used to have in the office where I could just pop in and say, hey, or jump out at you in, in the hall and scare you or have that conversation on the way to the car. I'm not gonna schedule a Zoom meeting for those sorts of things. So we saw an opportunity to build something that the world needs. Um, and it looks like um, even though COVID will be cured and there will be a vaccine and for different mutations will solve that too i'm sure that the world will stay changed in some meaningful way like we're seeing many large companies spotify last week saying you know what we like this remote thing anyone can work remotely as much as they want forever like we're we're just a remote company and there were only a handful of these you know the automatic or gitlab that would were actually 100% remote asynchronous communication and and it was a very hard it was a very hard life to live um, but now that we've kind of been forced into it we realize oh there's a lot of benefits to it i don't have a commute i can kind of take a break when I need to. I don't have to think about what lunch I'm packing and, and you know, all, all sorts of other things. So I think the world is gonna stay changed in, or as Mr. Incredible would say, stay saved in some meaningful way or percentage. And I only imagine the future of work to be more flexible, more remote, more dynamic um, than from where we are today. So I think COVID, was the thing that helped Volley exist, as well as many other tools that 
we're now starting to see or will see because we're realizing there's just a better way to work. And um, now that we're having to adopt that, we just need the tool set to get us there. And that's where we're playing. Yeah, I don't think people realize how much the world is going to stay changed, so to speak, right? Like something as simple as bowling, right? People should go do bowling alley, put your finger in this bowl that, you know, probably hundreds of people put their fingers in there, don't know if they wash their hands or not, eat nachos, hot dogs, you know, those days are gone probably. I'm, I'm sure they're pretty already sanitized it. And then, you know, just think, you know, you, you go to a, a toddler birthday party, right? Some random kid, you know, blows like candles and spits all the cake. They won't eat the cake, you know? So like, yeah, the world has definitely changed. It is, isn't it? You know, I went bowling during the pandemic because uh, my kids wanted to go bowling so bad. So I took them bowling, but everything, I was like, oh my gosh, these balls aren't washed and I'm putting my fingers in these holes. And, and you're right. It's like, but you know, what was hilarious is the bowlers that were there in that alley none of them were wearing masks like like we were the only people in this bowling alley wearing masks so i think i think like hardcore bowlers are a different breed i i don't know if they're gonna change much yeah true so josh recently you won a a, a tv show called david mitchell's two pitch two minute pitch competition can you talk about that yeah for sure uh david asked me to be on the the you know debut episode of um the two minute pitch um or two minute drill i think it's called um, and that was fun. Uh, I've never done a, a pitch competition like that. And it was, it was fun to kind of polish a pitch and, and, uh, you know, get it down and, and get That's you know, only two minutes, right? In two minutes, it's, it's hard, especially something like volley. It's, it's not like immediately gettable. It's hard to like get someone there and immediately see the problem and understand the solution and, and see that in their daily life. So it was a good exercise. I ended up losing, um, to uh, a lady that was doing a, a menopause pajamas um, business and she just had a great pitch and she was charming and, and they really liked her. So uh, I also learned how I can improve next time. And now, actually, I actually watched that on, on Blink, Blink Blue, Bloomberg TV. I might get you mixed with someone else. I remember the judges giving feedback. I'm thinking myself, you didn't know they only had two minutes, right? I'm sure if they had like five minutes, they would set all the stuff you're talking about, right? So I know that's to be kind of frustrating. Yeah, for sure. And then several several people in that same episode, uh, they only took like a minute and a half, and, and you know, and they were like, "Well, uh, you had thirty more seconds," and you know, they they were just not prepared, and they'd never done anything like that. Um, but they seemed to like what I was doing and like the pitch, and you know, I, I had some analog little typing or talking different ways you talk to your coworker. Um, so it was fun. So having done that, that the TV show competition, can you talk about the importance of as an entrepreneur, always putting yourself out there, always you know, talking about your idea, no matter what the, the platform is? Yeah, well, that, that's why I'm doing this podcasting thing. There's a couple of reasons. One, I'm just terrible at interviews. You probably already have discovered this if you're listening, um, that I, you know, I've been interviewed by TechCrunch or by Forbes or whoever, and they, they quote the most random things and it sounds like a third grader said it. So I, I'm just terrible at interviews. So I'm trying to get better at interviews and thinking on the spot, um, you're back to the introversion thing. Um, but I also think that the people that are likely to use Volley um, are probably listening to podcasts. Uh, you know, when I, when I start thinking who really wants to improve what they're doing, uh, who wants to improve their work or the, the the life of work or have more success in their life. Those people are probably listening to podcasts and people that aren't listening to podcasts. I don't know if they're going to be right for volley. So I think podcasts are probably the way to find our most engaged users. And it's been a, it's been a good way so far. So um, I'm solving my own, uh, you know, downfalls and issues and also getting a chance to talk about the problem in the product. So just I'm a, I'm a big believer that, you know, for every, you know, Coke, there's a Pepsi, every Winnie's is a McDonald, you know, who's your, like, who's the, your, your Pepsi to your volley, so to speak? Well, um, the closest one would be Marco Polo, but Marco Polo is to help families stay in touch. It's Marco Polo isn't really a, a business product. There's another, you know, business product called Voodle that's pretty close, um, but you know, if you really look at it under the hood, it's it's not the same beast. 
Um, and, and some people have compared us to Loom and Loom is you know, Loom or Vidyard or, or OneMob. And those are also asynchronous video products. So, you know, people put us in the same bucket. But the thing about Loom is you, you yes, you can record your screen or create a, a webcam video and send it to someone else but it's really a one-way transmission. It's not a threaded conversation. And that's the differentiation with Volley is you send a video to someone else and then they can send a video back and you volley back and forth in that way. Not, I send you a video of something I'm thinking about and then you can type comments on it, which is kind of the functionality of, of Loom. So yeah, I think that the threaded conversation is a major, major point of differentiation. And it's, it's a new thing. So um, the, there is an, a, an established, let's see, are we Pepsi or are we Coke? Uh, I, I, we're probably Coke. So there is an established Pepsi. <laughs> so Josh, what kind of metrics do you track for your company? You know, people say, you know, track CAC, track LTV, track users, all this different kind of stuff. For you, for you, for Vol, is there any specific metrics you're, you're, you're tracking? Yes, uh, two really meaningful metrics are K factor, which is our um, our measurement of viral growth. How how many users our users invite and bring to the the product. This is going to be uh, a meaningful factor for Volley because it's a product where it's a communication product. You know, so the first few people that had the telephone could only call a few people. The more people that have the phone that have Volley the more network effects kick in. So that's a meaningful factor. And the other one is retention. Um, and we look at that by day, by week, and by month. Um, how long, when a new user downloads the app, how long until they come back? And do they do some never come back? And what percentage is that? And, and what does that look like? And it, so if you have high retention and high K factor, you have a very valuable product that people find start to use and, and never let go of it and invite others into. And so that's what we're, you know, we're trying to build. That's why we measure. And then the third thing we measure is some sort of scale, but scale is kind of irrelevant. Like how many users you have, it's kind of irrelevant in, in isolation in absence of the other two. It's kind of a three, um, three point three legged stool that, that we look at that creates meaning for us. So Josh, for your user and customer, you going, uh, you know, a uh, are you trying to get a certain size company, certain industry, or just no, that doesn't matter? Well, we're learning that right now. We're trying to figure it out. We think um, certainly anyone who attends a meeting ever could use Volley, uh, right? So that's the large, you know, if you're thinking rings of a target, that's the outer ring. Okay, the next ring in is probably people who are working remotely that attend meetings. Okay, then let's move in another ring. Well, it's probably people who lead a team or have leadership or influence on, on that team that work remotely, that are knowledge workers that, that attend meetings. So that's what we think. Um, and those tend to be, you know, companies like ours, tech companies, startups, um, you know, early ventures, um, or even established companies who, who um, are working remotely. And because there are many of those right now, and there probably will be in the future, I think that's pretty large opportunity. So Jess, I want to change the subject just a little bit. I want you to talk about your passion for pickles. Ha. <laughs> okay. Well, um, it's in the blood. Uh, I'm a fifth generation pickler. My great, great grandfather, as far as, as this is as far back as we can trace it, had pickle recipes that my great grandfather wrote down in a leather bound book. And my family didn't have money to pass down, but I did get a leather bound recipe, pickle recipe book. And um, I have it sitting in my safe at home. And I, and when I moved to Utah 10 years ago, I started making pickles here because I used to make them with my dad in Michigan. So I always had enough for myself. But when I started making them here, I started giving them to friends and people I was meeting here. And then pretty soon friends of friends wanted them. And then friends of friends of friends wanted them. And it, it kind of grew out of hand and it became a pretty expensive endeavor that took, you know, lots of time each week to like make a thousand jars of pickles and give them away. So a few years ago, I started charging for them and built a website called Josh's Pickles. And I thought that was potentially going to be my next venture after I left my last company. And, um, and I, you know, I, I explored it for a few months and hired a pickle scientist and tried to figure out how to make this recipe shelf stable. And, went through the validation process only to find out that what I wanted to do was scientifically impossible. And 
Um, it's a pretty grindy and capital intensive business to pack organic product in glass jars, which are heavy to ship and breakable with like almost no margins. So coming from building software companies that are infinitely scalable with small teams and take, you know, not small amount of capital, but you know, a lot less than a pickle company. It was really hard for me to give a green light to the, the pickle opportunity, but I still grow and make pickles all, you know, I grow all of our own cucumbers and dill and all of the ingredients. And that's kind of the limit to what I produce each year. And I have, that's on my website, joshuspickles.com. You can get on the wait list. Um, but I sell out in about an hour every year when I announce. So from the time you, you, um, you plant the cucumber to the time the pickle's ready to eat, how long is that process? Is it a year or six months? No, no, it's about six weeks. Until, six weeks, okay. That well, oh, until the pickle's ready to eat. Sorry, yeah. I, th I thought you, I thought you were asking until the the pickle's ready to, or the cucumber's ready to pick. Uh, yeah, so it's a week after you pick them. It takes about a week for them to to fully cure in the in the, in the main recipe, the dill recipe. All of the sweet pickles are they're cooked, so they're ready to eat like the next day after you you pick them and, and jar them. Uh, but it takes about six to eight weeks for the the cucumber plant to come to maturity and start fruiting. So is anyone in your family going to keep on the family tradition or is it going to pretty much go away, so to speak? Well, all of my kids, uh, last year I was so busy um, because we were building Volley. Uh, all of my kids got involved and I paid them um, to do that. And so they kind of liked making money from this. And it was kind of a fun thing. Of course, I didn't have I didn't share the expenses with them and <laughs> tell them, you know, we probably burned all of the all of the money we made here, but I did just take all of our total gross revenue and divided it up amongst my kids. I mean, I'm sure that was a great experience for them. It was great, yeah. So who knows? Or they may just learn. You know, it it seems that your kids want to do only the things that you don't want them to do, and they want to, they don't want to do anything that you want them to do. So I I'm trying not to push too hard, just creating an opportunity. So Josh, you know, when it's, an entrepreneur starts out, they know, you know, you, you, you have to have money, right? Of course, the best way to bring on customers, but if you don't have no customers, do you, I mean, of course, each, each person is different, each situation is different, but there's no, there's, you know, there's um, small business loans, there's grants, there's fundraising, VC style, you know, bootstrapping. How do you recommend an entrepreneur think through these things? Well, you know, just like a doctor and a patient, it, you have the right prescription for the right illness or the right problem. So uh, for what I'm doing, um, building a software company from scratch, it takes a lot of capital. It takes a lot of people. Um, and typically companies like mine don't make a lot of money in the first several years. Even Slack, which sold for $27 billion, was still not profitable. So um, it, companies like that require venture funding. But if you're building like a, a let's say a, a marketing agency or a, a dev shop, you don't want venture funding. In fact, you don't want any investors. Your investors in those cases are your customers. You, you, what you want to do is go find your first deal, your first customer as soon as possible and start working with them with the skeleton crew and build, build things kind of uh, organically. And, um, you know, service companies like that can make a lot of revenue pretty quickly um, and build, build a company. And that's where I got started. So when I speak at universities to like entrepreneurship students, I'll often say, if you have a product idea, don't build it. Build a service company around that product idea in that space um, and, you know, so let's say I want to build an, uh, an HR software. Um, don't build the software. Go become like an HR consultant in some sort of way and sell your consulting services or your content creation services or your HIPAA course or whatever it is um, to HR managers and don't go get hundreds of those customers and then and, and build a, a profitable little business and then build your software product on top of that because you'll already have customers, you'll already understand the problem way better than you think you understand it today, for sure. So Josh, you're, you're on company number four. Can you tell about your process of building the culture that you want at each company? I'm sure you learned things each time and did, did things differently, right? Yeah, for sure. I remember one company, um, I, I went off like Moses on the mountaintop and brought back the stone tablets of our values and 
And then each Monday I, I would like teach the team our values. And that was about as valuable as throwing a seed on a stainless steel floor. Like it took no root, uh, you know, people just stared at, and I never heard a single person recite one of our values or even remember what they were. Um, so the team kind of needs to come up with them together, or at least the core team in the early days. And that's what I found is you, you've got to bring the team along in the journey. And the culture is not something you can even create. It's something you curate. It's something you, you kind of find. And it's, it's the mix of how we work and how we want to work and the way that we see the world. And so getting clarity around those things and, and capturing and crystallizing them in some meaningful way is a much better strategy than going off on the mountaintop and delivering them back to the team. So Josh, you talked about this a little bit before, but can you expand on the point of storytelling? Yeah, I think, you know, it's, it's an ancient form of, of messaging and, and people, you know, there, there's a lot of research that shows stories, um, stories stick and data doesn't unless it's wrapped in a story. So we, if, if we can't, if we're not delivered the story, we have to build our own story. And if someone has to build their own story, they may not build the same story that you want them to. So I always try to lead with, with stories when um, talking about a product or what we do or our users. Uh, in the beginning, that's hard because you don't have very many stories uh, when you're just starting. But now, you know, with Volley, we're, we're starting to hear from users kind of common themes and so I'm infusing that in some of our marketing materials and instead of, you know, a headline with a, a subtext of a really awesome thing to say about our product, I do a headline and then customer quote um, that says exactly what I would want to say, but, you know, it's more meaningful if, if a peer says it. So um, I think storytelling is a very powerful thing and I've certainly not mastered it, even though some people think I'm good at it. Uh, I I don't know that I would put my forth as a self forth as a great storyteller. So Josh, for your previous three companies, did you raise funds for all three of them, like venture capital, angel funding, or angel investing? Nope. Um, the, the first one I started just kind of how I recommended it was a service company. Um, and it was profitable very early. Um, we, you know, we were selling e-learning um, courses and, and selling custom e-learning courses. So we would go build, you give us your binders and your CDs and your DVDs, and we'll go off and build those into 3D animated, you know, interactive courses. And companies were willing to pay a, a decent sum to do that. So I was able to, you know, sell and, and get many deals with several companies and um, hire the team to build those things. And, and Maestro was and still is profitable. Um, and it was from those profits that it was actually able to build Bloomfire, my second company. Bloomfire was the other 90% of what you don't learn to do your job um, from training, yeah, because you only learn about 10% of what you need to know to do your job typically from training. So Bloomfire was kind of a social learning platform. It was knowledge management as they call it today. And today Bloomfire is one of the premier knowledge management platforms out there. But, uh, you know, 12 years ago, you know, was right after Twitter launched. We just weren't ready to be social at work. Um, and um, so so it, we actually built Bloomfire from the profits of, of Maestro instead of building a, a war chest or a, I don't know if a war chest is accurate, but uh, like a, a war suitcase of, of cash. We, we put that cash into a software product called Bloomfire and it was successful. It was acquired in like 18 months after coming to market. It was it was a pretty hot product. We launched it at South by Southwest and it was a lot of fun to build. But then, you know, my third and fourth company, I have raised venture funds because uh, I thought it would be fun to see what it's like to burn rocket fuel and what, what's it like to go fast and burn $50,000 on LinkedIn in a month. And did that do anything? No, dang it. Well, okay, we're not going to do that again. So it's been a, a great learning process, but it's really hard to build a, a valuable, enduring software product with a freemium model without um, great investors and, and venture capital. Um, Josh, what's your vision for Bali? Well, um, to save the world from death by meetings is probably the 
current vision. It's it's evolving. Um, we we're hearing that's where it started at least, and that's what I've been saying. But here, sitting here today, I'm realizing that that may not be it. You know, it's it's to enable the future of work, whatever that is. But some of the things that we're hearing from users that are um, pretty encouraging. Um, you know, like the introvert or the team manager I mentioned earlier, who, you know, said, I'm, I'm just able to show up different in Bali, or Bali is bringing back the fun and spontaneity that we once had that we lost, and we didn't realize it. Or it's, you know, I'm getting to know my team on a whole new level. And those are pretty exciting to me, um, because it, it turns out the, you know, this, our relationship can be summed up in our communication or said differently, our communication sums up to equal relationship and relationship is trust. So to the extent that we can enable free and efficient, rich communication with one another, um, we can enable relationships and, and connection. And that's something we sort of took for granted when we were all sitting in the same building together. Uh, but then when we re went remote, we don't really have a way to do that. And when I write you a Slack message, it's not the same as leaning over and saying that thing. And, and I, you know, I've got a joke, but I'm not going to trust Slack to, you know, to, to deliver my masterful comedic timing. And, and I'm, I'm not going to also schedule a zoom to tell you this joke. So I guess I won't tell you the joke. Right. Um, so it's, it's just kind of that little bit of friction that prevents us from doing all of the things that seemed in isolation, that walk to the car or the story that you told at lunch or that funny moment around the water cooler, those didn't seem like anything, but until you take them away. And then you realize, oh, that's that was relationship. That was the bond that kept us together. So the the vision for Volley very much may be evolving before our eyes and, you know, with, with our users at the forefront, kind of pioneering how to use this technology to move work forward. So long way to say, I don't know, but, uh, you know, there, there's a couple of thoughts. Josh, so far, have you found that a certain company, a certain industry, a certain something has been like the favorite, favorite user of Volley? Like, have you like gotten the best reviews from a certain specific industry? Well, it, it really seems the more like our company, a remote distributed tech company um, is, is getting the most use and it's clicking for them. And they're sort of techie and they understand, you know, apps and video and how to connect things. And so, um, yeah, I, it's, it's, us, it's typically companies like ours that, that are getting the most use of it. I think that'll evolve long-term. And we sort of predicted that in the beginning, you know, knowledge workers who are working remotely um, and somewhat technical. Josh, is there anything that I should have asked you that I haven't asked you yet? Uh, I don't know. I, I would say pickles, um, but you already asked that. So I can't think of anything now. Josh, can you give us your social media link so people can reach out to you and also how they can sign up for Volley? Sure. You can look me up on LinkedIn or go to volleyapp.com and find me on Volley. That's V-O-L-L-E-Y-A-P-P.com. And to our listeners, we have the links to our social media on the show notes. You can find the show notes at www.cameronshr.com. And also be sure to support our crowdfunding campaign at Cameron's HR. For that, you can go to HTTPS Cameron's HR that CO slash crowdfunding. So Josh, we'll come to the end of our talk. Can you give us any wisdom or advice on anything you want to talk about? Hmm, wisdom. I would say if you're building a company or actually this is probably generally, it's not just for entrepreneurs, this is for anyone who's building something meaningful, relentlessly pursue the most impactful thing. Um, and that's, that's a really hard thing to do, but the way that I try to do that, and I kind of have to keep resetting myself on that is I think about, um, what would, I, I think to myself, this question, what would blank insert the name of your favorite entrepreneur or leader or influence, whoever that be, what would, let's say Richard Branson, you know, in this case, what would Richard Branson do today? So as you get down and look at your to-dos for the day and record your morning stand-up, ask yourself, what would blank do today? Um, someone that you, you would 
think could do your job potentially better than you, right? And if if your answer is the things that you planned on doing, well, good. Then you you're doing the most impactful thing. But if your answer is and typically is for me, no, Richard Branson wouldn't be writing this stupid blog article and he wouldn't be like, you know, following up on, you know, th this thing that so-and-so charged us, the, the healthcare company did, you know, he would be handing that stuff off and he'd be go getting on his yacht and doing some deal with some multinational company or something like that, right? I don't have a yacht, but uh, I can do my version of what Richard Branson would do. So, uh, that's, yeah, I don't know, one little bit of wisdom to, to try to re pursue the most, re relentlessly pursue the most impactful thing. Josh, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. You bet, man. Thanks for having me on. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. And remember to be great every day.